Hello, I am Father Kasmirema, SVD of Radio Veritas Asia. Welcome to the special program, Voice of Asian Bishops. It is an honor and blessing to have with us today, Most Reverend Bishop Bartolome G. Santos of Iba Diocese, Philippines. Bishop Bart, welcome. Bishop Bartolome Gaspar Santos was born in Santa Maria, Bulacan, in the Diocese of Malolos, Philippines, on December 1, 1967. After his high school studies at the Immaculate Conception Minor Seminary of Malolos and courses in philosophy and theology at the University of Santo Tomas Ecclesiastical Faculties of Manila, he obtained a licentiate in Biblical Theology in 1999 from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. After his ordination as a priest in August 1992, he served as vicar in the San Pascual Bailon Parish of Obando from 1992 to 1994 and in the San Isidro Labrador Parish, Bulacan from 1994 to 1995. Returning home after his studies in Rome from 1999 to 2005, he became rector of the Immaculate Conception Minor Seminary of Malolos from 2005 to 2009, where he served earlier as spiritual director and professor from 1995 to 1996. He was appointed rector and moderator of the pastoral team of the National Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in Valenzuela City in 2009, and he became a parish priest in 2010. He served as Vicar General of the Diocese of Malolos from 2013 until his ordination as Bishop on April 30, 2018 and his installation as Bishop of Iba Zambales on May 25 of the same year. You have served more than five years in the Diocese of Iba, yeah. and you are the fifth uh, Bishop in the Diocese. Can you tell us, uh, provide us a general picture of your Diocese? Uh, the Diocese of uh, Iba, Sambales, uh, is located at the West Philippine Seaside and it is also part of the northwest of uh, the biggest island of the Philippines, it's Luzon. We have uh, a population of uh, more than 900,000 but 85% uh, uh, are Catholic and so it's like more than 700,000. We only have like 24 parishes, three mission stations. The three mission stations are in... Uh, the far flung area uh, near Mount Pinatubo, the mining area, and in a place we call the New Zealand of the Philippines because it is in a lake. And so uh, the diocese really has been um, existing as a diocese only for more than 40 years because uh, uh, it was only like 1992 when it was established as a diocese. But the Christianity has been here for more than 400 years starting in the northern side, uh, it is called the uh, uh, Sigayan. Sigay is like a shell, no? That was the former name of Santa Cruz town. And we have three towns, three parishes, uh, more than 400 years old now. What are the most um, ministries you offer in the diocese? The most, perhaps, the most appreciated by the people? Well, we only have a very rural way of life from Subic town up north. But here in Olongapo, we are located now in SBMA. We are in San Roque Chapel. This is uh, urbanized. No? But we have more of our indigenous people. We call the Aita people. So our apostolate uh, will really be very, very challenging when we go up on the mountain. Because on the seaside, we don't have island parishes. We don't have. We have island communities, but not island parishes. But we have a lot of mission stations on the mountain. That's where the the Town proper, the parishes have challenges on our mission and on our apostolate. Then. Listening to those explanations, where do you want to see in five years of your diocese from now? Since we are preparing for the golden anniversary of the diocese in 2032, we have been developing a lot of things, especially our schools, 
Uh, we have the innovative uh, one educational system. We have 20 parochial schools, four colleges under one board. We don't have school directors. We only have the board and then the principal. And then our campus ministry uh, is really active after pandemic. I think we are the only diocese in the Philippines that during pandemic, we didn't lose enrollees and we didn't really lose faith. Uh, I mean, uh, there are more things to do. Uh, parishes are now alive again and parishes are now back to its like normal way of living. Let's move to the other question about your vocation as priest and of course as a bishop. Can you tell us what has inspired you to say yes to God's call to be a priest and of course... Well, a it's a, a bit uh, strange when I started uh, my life as a seminary at the age of 12. Oh. Not because of priesthood, not because of spirituality. I don't have one during my 12-year-old life. Mm -hmm. I only have my basketball and my football. So I went into the seminary because of the football field and also because of the basketball court. That's the beginning. That's my yes. That is why even up to my uh, latter years of priesthood before I became bishop, uh, I was ordained a bishop at the age of 50. I was still playing basketball, an official game, at the age of 50. And one game, I suffered a knee injury and that was the stop by God. God telling me, you stop playing basketball because um, uh, you will soon. But I didn't know that then. But after a few months, I was ordained as a bishop. You've been served as bishop for sev several years, I suppose. And tell us, what are major challenges you face as a bishop? You know, I'm a happy person. I'm a joyful person. I always believe in the grace of God that supplants and suffices and provides me the strength to be persevering, <coughs> always eager in whatever God wants me to do in my mission. Yeah, there will always be challenges from issues from uh, the parishes, clergy, the people, not to mention the issues of environment, not to mention the issues of the political arena in the country and even in our province. But all of them, with the grace of God, you can overcome all of them. You just have to always have the dialogue with these people. You always have to have a dialogue with your priests, a dialogue with your people, listen to them, be kind, be always good to them, always show the compassionate heart, always let the presence of God be around so that all your challenges will really be overcome. Talking about your style of approaching the priest, dialogue with the people, FABC known with triple dialogues, dialogue with culture, dialogue with religion, and dialogue with the poor people. How this triple dialogue has implemented in your diocese? Bishop? You know, we always have this uh, organizational culture in every parish, diocese, or even in, in every company. Like, if uh, for sure, RVA has uh, an organizational culture. How do you organize yourself? How do you put up things? How do you set up things? How do you relate? So, this culture including the cultural way of life of the indigenous people. You have to, when, when I arrive, I ask the priest, who are the poorest of the poorest in the diocese? They all said the indigenous people, the Aita people. Maybe you already have encountered some, no? So they are uh, mountain dwellers. They do not really go to the town proper because of inferiority. So I have to go up to them, like, you know, challenging myself, to ride the Carabao, to cross the Lahar River, to take the poor by poor sometimes, stay with them, dine with them, eat with them, just listen to them, play with them, laugh with them. Not necessarily converting them immediately, but just being with them will be more than enough for them. And also with other religions here. Uh, we have a good relationship with the other sect, with other, even with the brother Muslims, because uh, we have some common... Um, uh, meeting and dialogue also, we dine and we talk about issues and we share our uh, mission with the uh, uh, youth and uh, sometimes because of the uh, occasions on the province and in of the diocese, we invite them to pray with us and this is really very good. The ugly payant, they are really very, very good with us and me, we to them because we are like brothers and neighbors. We don't quarrel with each other. We even join during procession on Holy Week. We really share. We even, uh, not really to, to have a kind of uh, exchange of priests. No, we do not do that. Not even exchange of faithful. But we join together 
on some occasions of uh, Catholic faith and similarly like procession, Holy Week. Talking about that dialogue, uh, Bishop, how the Synod uh, process uh, took place in your, in your um, diocese? Yeah, Father Gaspin, we follow the uh, process given to us by the dicastery on how to uh, proceed with the synodality from the poorest of the poor, mm -hmm. from the periphery, mm -hmm. our catechists, our representatives, our volunteers, our youth. They, every parish made a team that they will be going to the peripheries and start the uh, dialogue and uh, data and all of the questions uh, they have to ask the people, the simplest one, the hardest one. We were able to gather a very good uh, data on the synodal process that now it is really being used for, for our pastoral programming that we have prepared in order to reach our 2032 golden anniversary. If you would like to give uh, suggestions to your uh, priests or lay people in your diocese, um, what suggestion would you like them so they be become more synodal mindset in their ministries? We always have to practice this... Um, dialogue of uh, listening to give more space and time to listen rather than to talk because uh, we have i think spoken so much and talked so much uh, verbally using words in order to proclaim but i think I, I i i am really suggesting to do more of the action rather than of the talking so the walk the talk is really like your idiomatic expression but synodality is really like walk the talk. Instead of just talking a lot, but it's walking a lot. Meaning actions. We need more of the action. That, that's why I, I, I have been asking our commission on formation and the clergy. That's why we have the 10-year program of BEC. And then the BEC, we all connect to the BEC because it's really more of a grouping together, even to the peripheries, walking together and visiting them listening and hearing so that we may be able to respond and address all the issues in the diocese and we will be able to at least respond by evangelization. That's interesting, Bishop. One of the points that discuss in the Synod and Synodality now is lady participation in the church. How do you see the lady participation and also, of course, youth participation in your diocese? Um, the lay empowerment and the lay participation in the diocese is still ongoing you know, because they have been used to dependent on the priest for everything. What the priest says, what the priest command, what the priest program, what the priest initiate, that will be the program known now, nowadays. But that is why we have the BEC so that the lay empowerment, the lay participation, the lay leaders will really be more active more participative. Let's say, for example, of the school. I may mm. give you the, always the example of the school. Formerly, all the 20 parochial schools and four colleges, they have their own director, priest director. So we removed them, not because we do not like the priest, but we wanted more of the principal and the lay administrators to really manage the school. And we priests should really administer the spirituality side. That's why all the parish priests and assistants, they're all chaplains of the school, but not as director. So in that way, you are really giving the uh, lay people more participation on the active side and more responsibility on the evangelization rather than most of the things being done by the priest, command, etc. But now it's a, it's a way of we turning our eyes and turning our face on doing our ministry as priests for the sacrament, for the spirituality, for the uh, teaching, but not more mm. of really to say uh, too much action, you know. I mean, I'm not contradicting what I've said earlier, but you know, the priest cannot really do much for more, many action because he will leave some space for more important things like the sacrament, which we can only do and perform, but mm. not the lay people. So now, uh, the lay people participating more on the activities and program is really very good for us. Still in line with that, Bishop, um, the COVID pandemic uh, has challenged the mission of church in terms of you know, proclaiming or evangelization. In your observation, in your diocese, of course, based also on your experience, 
what do you think how the church should uh, continue disseminate the word of god after this post pandemic during those time we were able to at least uh, proclaim the gospel in a very different way we didn't stop our school the school flourish because of the modular and the online classes the youth keeps on coming back because they're the only ones allowed outside the parish outside the house going to the parish so they manage the live streaming the sacraments the the masses the proclamation the formation so now we have to continue not only the live streaming not only the media not mm. only but we have to combine it like you in the school you have a blended learning of uh, online classes and face to face so just the same in our evangelization you have to combine media what you've been doing your best doing it and the face to face you have to go there and meet the people touch them mm. and let their heart be felt not just to hi hello to them in the video call or in the zoom live stream no 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 it's really different when you go to their place and meet them face to face so that's th that the learning i ha i am really putting inside my mind that uh, when now we proclaim the gospel you have to do both ways the mm. fast test way which is the media and the best way which is face to face yes. you really let god be felt everywhere if i ask what do you want or people want to know about your diocese tell them going to iba zambales to our province to our diocese for you to know how god loves everyone how god has taken care of nature how, how god has taken care even of our poorest people nobody gets hungry in this province you know why because we have vast of land to plant to till the land to plow the land and we have vast of sea of water to take the source of food that's why during pandemic we have an oversupply of food not to mention if you have these resources then people can really be of helping each other mm -hmm. and we can really do our way of helping our outsider brothers and sisters and neighbors so uh for me um sambal is one of the places in the philippines most of our lakes and our waterfalls and our rivers are undiscovered but it doesn't matter if it will be undiscovered but it really uh, gives us so much inspiration of how god has been taking care of us of, of the diocese of the province and even of this city yeah, of Olongapo. Uh, I am not saying we are a class A, no, I'm not saying that. But we are living a kind of way of life, simple enough to ensure the joy and happiness and contentment of the people. Thank you very much, Bishop. We have to end there. I am Father Kasmir Nema, SPD of Radio Veritas Asia. Thanks for watching and see you next time for more interesting conversations with Asian bishops. Radio Veritas Asia, the voice of Asian Christianity. Radio Veritas Asia mobile app offers services in English and 21 Asian languages. Download the Radio Veritas Asia app. To get more videos from Radio Veritas Asia, comment, like and share.